Good morning, good morning. Welcome to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue where there's always harmony going on in this area. We're delighted to have you here and it's our prayer that you will uh, gain some nuggets and that you will leave here with some inspiration and that you'll also leave here with a sense of hope that you will identify that there's really a way in which you can do trans trans transform neighborhoods and rejuvenate communities. St. Philip's School and Community Center with its partnerships with Trek and with so many other entities is delighted to be on the forefront of making that happen here in Dallas. But I won't talk very long because I have some people who do a better job of it here. We're a school and a community center. We leverage ourselves to be a neighborhood change agent. And in doing so, we have something very special and unique with our programming is that we teach students to serve the community. So we embed in them into their DNA the notion that God placed you here for one special reason, and that is to serve others. And you're best able to serve others by advancing yourself academically, physically, spiritually, and socially. And so we have something called the St. Philip's Creed that embodies what we expect our students to live by while they're here and in their lives beyond St. Philip's because we believe that the time is gone for our communities to wait for the federal government or wait for the city or wait for the churches or anyone else to bring about change in their neighborhoods. We believe that our students do it. So, for example, a group of our boys, fifth grade boys, at the beginning of the school year, the teachers all across the campus ask the students to identify what problem do you want to solve? What community-based problem? What problem do you want to solve? And a person had just been attacked by dogs. And so their project for that year, they wanted to build dog houses. And so all throughout the course of the year, they were building dog houses and their math and their reading and all of their learning was evolving around these dog houses. And at the end of the year, they were able to present those and even sell some, <laughs> some dog houses. So we try to have our students see service in action because St. Philip's School and Community Center demonstrates that on a daily basis. So we have a group of second graders. Their teacher is Mrs. Pate, and she can teach math to a rock. <laughs> uh, but they're going to say the St. Philip's Creed. How about that first start? 
So thank you all for being here. Thank you uh, particularly to Dr. Flowers. We had a bus tour on our way here this morning and really had an understanding. Dr. Flowers gave us the story as we approached the school. I also want to thank the students for, for their being here this morning and welcoming us. Um, and to the St. Philip's community, it does take a community to do this. The faculty and staff here has been tremendous in helping us put this together, and I thank them. Uh, I thank the Dallas uh, Fed staff as well for all of their work. They were here last night. I think they did a nice job in putting this together, so I really want to thank them so much. My name is Alfreda Norman, and I am a senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. And on behalf of the Dallas Fed and um, my colleagues, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Um, and especially, I'm very pleased and happy to see um, that we brought two really important guests here today. Um, Dallas Fed President Rob Kaplan and the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Richard Clarida. And in your packet, you've got a, an agenda here. And so I, we have full bios of our guests today. And we also have a listing of our speakers. And I wanted to make sure that you review those as well because we're going to get right to it today uh, in, our, in our program. Today is, an, uh, is uh, an important day. It launches an important new initiative by the Federal Reserve, which we're calling Fed Listens. Over the next few months, Fed Listens will be going across the country for the very first, uh, and the very first one is this morning here at St. Philip's. So thanks to everyone again for attending and being here today. As our nation's central bank, part of the goals of the Federal Reserve are to promote a healthy economy and a strong financial system. One of the main ways we do that is through monetary policy. This year, the Fed is taking time to review the way we conduct monetary policy to find out if the strategies we use could be improved. And we're seeking a broad range of outside perspectives to inform that review. That's where Fed Listens comes in. Some of the key questions we're asking includes, how does the Fed's monetary policy impact people in local communities? How well does it reflect the full picture of economic conditions across the country? To understand that, Fed officials are visiting communities across the United States to get input from the people who live and work there. That's why we're in South Dallas today. And we're, we're here to listen, to understand what's going on in this community, and how it connects with our nation's monetary policy. And to do that, we're turning to the experts that are sitting up here, uh, those who are part of this community and work for its future every day. We're especially grateful to our seven panelists that are here who represent organizations that do serve the community, and they're gonna be sharing their perspectives on a variety of local economic issues. We realize that there are many, many issues and it was very hard to pick seven, so obviously seven are not all of them, but you'll hear when you hear them speaking the importance of collaboration on all of these issues. So we're going to begin with their presentations. I've asked them to take just a few, six minutes to just tell everything that they do and highlight, but they're going to, they've honed that, so they're going to do that. I'm their official timekeeper, so I'm going to stand up when it's time for you to move on. But that way, then once you finish your presentations, then we'll, uh, Rob and Richard will be on stage and they'll have a chance to ask you any clarifying questions or any follow-ups. Sound good? All right, and then after that, um, we're gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Richard and Rob to take the stage as our center guests here, and we're gonna get started. So can I join the stage? And before we get started with our speakers, and oh, by the way, the audience, you have a part in this as well. We're hoping that once we have the presentations and a little uh, conversation back and forth, if you have questions, uh, we have mics. There are three mics here on the, on the, in the center aisle and on the sides. And if you have questions, we'd love for you to share those with us today. Um, hopefully we'll have time to address those, but we'll also um, be around for a little bit afterward before we get on the bus back to the bank. So again, please refer to your programs for the full bios of these two distinguished guests that we have here. Um, and before we get started, I thought maybe you could share with the audience a little bit about what you do as the vice chair and what do you do as the Federal Reserve president. And tell us a little thing about this thing called monetary policy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of uh, comments uh, on that. I've only been on the job for five months, so uh, I can maybe chat about that a bit uh, as well. But I'd really like to thank 
the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and especially St. Philip's School and Community Center for hosting this event, and, and to Terry Flowers, who I just met uh, this morning, but I'm so inspired by uh, his energy and his vision and how this whole neighborhood has been uh, transformed. As Alfredo mentioned, uh, this uh, my visit here today is part of a system-wide effort at the Federal Reserve uh, System, um, what we're calling these Fed Listen, so uh, those of us in the Federal Reserve System can get out uh, and hear from you all and hear about the ways in which our monetary policy decisions uh, impact communities and impact uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, the experiences of South Dallas are an important part of of this, of course, in the landscape of, of Dallas, and we want to hear about uh, this community and hear about uh, the uh, projects that are uh, un underway. Um, I've had an opportunity just so far this morning to see a bit of the neighborhood and to hear from Terry uh, on, uh, on our tour this morning, uh, sort of a before and after of what this neighborhood has become, and it's, and it's very, very uh, inspiring. Uh, in, in terms of myself, uh, the, the Federal Reserve makes the monetary policy for the United States, and there's a large committee. Rob and I, uh, President Kaplan and I are colleagues uh, on, on that. And so we focus on interest rates. We have a mandate to achieve maximum employment uh, and, and price stability. But Rob and I and our colleagues agree that to do that effectively, we need to move beyond the numbers and the statistics. Uh, and that's really what this is about today. So thank you very much, and turn it over to Rob. Uh and we're, we're thrilled to have you here. And again, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Flowers. We spent a, at the Dallas Fed. We spent a lot of time uh, with Terry Flowers and uh, and this institution, and we're incredibly impressed with his leadership and uh, all the great progress you're making. And and so, just building on what what Richard said, there's 12 reserve banks in the United States. Uh, the one I'm the head of is the 11th district. We number them, uh, one through 12. Uh, we've got 1,300 employees at the Dallas Fed. We cover all of the state of Texas, parts of New Mexico and Louisiana. Uh, and we're probably best known, as, as uh, Richard was just saying, for monetary policy, setting interest rates, other monetary policy elements in the United States. We also regulate the banks. We oversee payments, treasury services. But what may not be as well known, but I think people in the community are getting to know, we, we also have a big community outreach effort uh, and we have a goal at the Dallas Fed of being a leading citizen in the communities we serve. And we do research on a number of issues and we do outreach and convene on early childhood literacy, child poverty, which is a big issue, for example, in Dallas, as well as other cities in this state. Um, uh, quality of secondary education, college readiness and skills training and access to financial services. And we're very keenly aware, and I think you can't live in Dallas and not be aware of the fact, as wealthy as we are, and as well as the state is doing and the city is doing, we have uh, one in three kids uh, in this city are growing up in poverty. Uh, and we don't have as inclusive a prosperity as I think would be best if we're gonna have a bright future, uh, GDP uh, growth, and all of us would do better. And so we think of uh, what's going on here at, um, at St. Phillips as an investment in the future from, for all citizens. And we, we try to convene events like this to draw attention to the things we can all do as leaders to try to build our community and therefore build our state and build our future. So we're thrilled to be here and we're looking forward to learning and asking questions today. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. So I think we'll start with Kelly, Kelly Morell. Kelly is the principal of St. Philip's School and Community Center. The St. Philip's School provides college preparatory education for grades pre-K through six. The Community Center provides social services and resources to assist neighborhood families in enhancing the quality of their life. Kelly? Morning, everyone. Morning. Great. Um, I just want to thank uh, Vice Chairman Clarida uh, and the Dallas Fed President Rob Kaplan just for this opportunity to uh, share with you the educational needs and concerns of this community. South Dallas reflects the makeup of many urban cities in America. It is filled with concerned citizens 
that have the desire to change their community, their living situation, and their destiny. But they lack the financial resources, and in some cases, the knowledge and opportunity to move out of their current state. When we identify the problems within education and our students in South Dallas, the underlying issue is not their cognitive ability to learn, but simply the state of poverty they are in. In Dallas ISD, 88% of students are identified as economically disadvantaged. But in South Dallas alone, the average percent of students that are economically disadvantaged is an overwhelming 94%. A major concern is in our city is the wealth distribution along with racial and ethnic inequality. There is something broken about a system that within three zip codes has more than 90% of their children living in poverty. Dr. King said, true compassion is more than just flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that the edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. South Dallas residents are confronted with the reality that quality jobs are not in their neighborhood. They don't have equal access to opportunities that their wealthier peers have. And there's an image of their community that is stained with assumptions from those that live outside of their community. This community is dealing with not only closing the achievement gap in our schools, but the opportunity gap and the income gap. It is said that low socioeconomic status children have fewer cognitive enrichment opportunities. The effects of poverty have significant impact on a child's academic success. Children who experience poverty during their preschool and early school experience lower rates of school completion. Data from the Infant Health and Development Program show that 40% of children living in chronic poverty had deficiencies in at least two areas of functioning, such as language and emotional responsiveness. Dr. King said, it's all right to tell a man to lift himself up by his bootstraps, but it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his bootstraps. The need in South Dallas, and quite honestly, many urban cities in America, is the intentional financial investment towards education in order to lift someone out of poverty. It is education that gives one the keys to the doors of possibility. We have an epidemic of what is termed as the lost Einsteins. These are students with brilliant minds and amazing potential but unfortunately, the financial circumstance they were born into is dictating their future success. What will become of these lost Einsteins with the lack of opportunities and support needed to cultivate and shape their brilliant minds? To combat these issues that plague South Dallas, St. Philip School and Community Center seek to be an oasis and develop the entire family. We recognize that in order to educate children, the family needs resources. Our community center and food pantry address the external needs of families so that children can focus on learning. Our athletic program and our after school program provide the much needed mentorship that the kids in our community need. We partner with organizations, both large and small, in order to give back to this community. Our school changes the narrative that we must pity children in poverty to showing empathy to those in poverty. We don't pity because pity breeds low expectations, as if one is destined to stay in their situation. But we empathize because we believe in the capability of our students and our neighborhood. We do this through our graduate profile, developing servant leaders who enrich their communities through their actions. They serve with empathy, responsibility, and inspire through leadership. We develop students that are culturally aware and advocate for social justice. We emphasize practicing tolerance, justice, loving kindness, and the celebration of our various differences. Our students are committed to inter- and intrapersonal wellness, believing that a healthy mind, body, and spirit will make them vessels that are equipped to positively impact this world. There is a focus on developing students that are Christ-centered and intellectually driven. 
They will exude confidence in the classroom because they know who they are and that they were made in the image of God. While standardized tests are important, they are not the only benchmark that signifies success for our students. We believe in developing the whole child and support their other gifts and talents outside of the classroom. Allowing our students to embrace their creativity enables them to see their self-worth and shine bright. To close the achievement gap and the opportunity gap, we must address the whole child and invest in early education for our students, in after-school programs, in summer enrichment, to close the academic gaps and provide intervention. And we must have significant parent education programs. To improve the livelihood of our children, we have to improve the livelihood of their parents. It is said that procrastination is the thief of time. I respectfully propose that we must have a sense of urgency for the time is now. We cannot be satisfied or cynical, but must be driven to achieve exceptional education for all children in the South Dallas Fair Park neighborhoods. Thank you. Well done, thank you, Kelly. You might want to st st remain standing in case, do you have any questions or follow up? I might just ask one, Kelly, and I've asked, and you've heard me ask you this before, what's the number one constraint that, uh, that you need to address in order to improve, uh, improve what you're doing? Well, I would definitely, since you're the financial gurus, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> definitely finances for um, after school programming. Um, so with St. Phillips, we seek to support neighboring public schools. Um, and one of the things that we've been faced with is transportation. Although we think that everybody's in walking distance, and I don't want to touch anybody's <laughs> um, presentation, but all we think that everybody's in walking distance, part of the issue is if they come to our after-school program or if we want to send them to another after-school program, how do they get home? So um, I would say in order to improve education, if we can definitely focus on after school intervention, instruction, I think we see some great gains. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Kelly. Next is Tavia Morel, Program Director of Miles of Freedom. Miles of Freedom supports individuals and families impacted by incarceration and helps men and women coming out of prison rebuild their lives through housing, employment, and other opportunities. Good morning. Good morning. Um, when I was invited to come speak here today, I had some preconceived ideas of what I really thought I would say. Um, I thought there would be discussions about the fact that not all residents in Dallas are benefiting from this region's growth. And the reality that Dallas is, has, still has one of the highest concentrations of poverty in the nation. Or maybe a discussion of the working poor formerly incarcerated, in a community that is underemployed and to jobs paying low wages with no benefits. But these discussions would be counterproductive to exploring what this community is really about. This community has remained resilient and hopeful for many, many generations despite adversity. We have survived by a spirit of entrepreneurship and trading skills and services and goods between each other in our own neighborhoods. South Dallas is full of proud and hardworking people that are dedicated to our communities and that want to be a part of building a better place to live. And these communities are organizing and they're demanding a voice at the table. So how do we use employment opportunities to empower a community that is surviving to become a community that is thriving? How do we foster an environment of economic opportunity? Economists say that the factors of production are land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So where does that leave South Dallas? We have land. 
We have 185 square miles of prime property, larger than the city of Atlanta. And we have a labor force. We have tens of thousands of people who are ready, willing, and able to go to work. So that leaves us with capital and entrepreneurship. So how are we to produce capital with a community that is 39% asset poor? We must work with the people in the community through investments, development, and entrepreneurship to lead to economic growth. In looking at the employment landscape for the people in South Dallas, I have to say that it's not good enough to ask if the people I serve have the ability to ask for higher hourly wages. Taking an individual from $8 an hour to $10 an hour is not going to substantially impact their quality of life. My question is, where are the jobs for the people I serve in this neighborhood that gives them the ability to ask for higher annual salaries with benefits? Is enticing large corporations with incentives to select South Dallas enough to shift the employment landscape? I don't know. But what I do know is that the people of South Dallas should be able to find high paying jobs in South Dallas. And the people of North Dallas should be able to find high paying jobs in South Dallas. We are not going to shift until changes are made in development and investment and our residents aren't required to make a one way, three hour commute by train and bus to travel 30 miles to parts of the Metroplex for a chance at substantial employment. In looking at economic factors that influence access to employment, opportunities in South Dallas, I must wonder, are we empowering South Dallas residents to invest in our own communities by building businesses and cultivating entrepreneurship that not only allows us to spend money in our neighborhood, but encourages us to spend money in our own neighborhood. Workforce development programs are great, but workforce development, to be effective, there must be stronger connections between workforce development and the industry demand and actual employment. Workforce development is simply not enough if the relationship with employers has not been developed so that there is a pipeline for people to be hired. South Dallas has made some huge strides over the last few years. The tax base has risen. Abandoned homes have been torn down. But where are the market risk takers that are ready to think of innovative new ideas to invest in development that will attract prosperity to this area. It would be beneficial to see more engagement from young professionals, corporations, investments, creating opportunities, entrepreneurship, and capital to keep the momentum moving forward. I'm afraid this small snapshot of our community doesn't do it justice. The focus must be to develop the strength and assets that we have available in this community. There is much work to be done with the stakeholders in this community that believe we have the ability to thrive. South Dallas is worthy. The people of South Dallas are worthy. They are worthy of employment opportunities, paying living wages, and the ability to sustain a quality life and their families. South Dallas is worthy of capital investment. And that means investment in the land and investment in the people. Thank you. Thank you, Tavia. Don't go anywhere, just in case. Good job. Any thoughts or follow -up questions? I think I could, I'll probably come back in a little bit and ask more, but okay. Okay, it was a great presentation. Thank okay. you. Thank you.
Next, we have Steve Benton. Steve is a financial coach for the Elder Financial Safety Center at the Senior Source, a collaborative partnership between the Senior Source and the Dallas County Probate Courts and District Attorney's Office. The Elder Financial Safety Center helps older adults avoid the dangers of financial uncertainty and exploitation. Steve? Well, good morning. When I was first asked to speak to some Fed representatives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, I went, uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, I was relieved to find out it was at the 1600 Pennsylvania here in Dallas. But for the past 58 years, the nonprofit Senior Source has worked uh, to improve the quality of life for older adults in the greater Dallas area through protection, elder care, financial security, advocacy, volunteerism, and employment services. The Elder Financial Safety Center, as was mentioned, was formed in 2014. It's a unique collaboration with the Senior Source, the Dallas County Probate Courts, and the District Attorney's Office to directly address the financial viability and the financial vulnerability of older adults. This is a gateway issue to their public safety and security. It affects everything where they can live, what they can afford, transportation, as was mentioned earlier, and empowered and, and access to services, to name just a few. Since its inception five years ago, the Elder Financial Safety Center has impacted over 21,000 older adult lives. We've secured over $88 million in, in, in our community and empowered, it's a fancy word for educated, over 24,000 people. I've been asked to speak to the economic and financial challenges of older adults where Federal Reserve decisions might impact, especially in the South Dallas area. This is a key service demographic of the senior source and the Elder Financial Safety Center. From a macro view, there's 108 million people in the U.S. that are now over 50 years old. That is one-third of the population. 78 million of those are baby boomers, the silver tsunami as they're called the pig and the python. They've affected everything as they have aged, from diapers to grade schools to colleges to home building, and now they're entering their retirement years. I love to use the illustration of the Olympic opening ceremony, which we all love to watch and see that flag bearer come out of the tunnel and our team behind. Well, our flag ba uh, bearer is a baby boomer by the name of Kathleen Casey Kirschling. She was born seconds after midnight on January 1st, 1946, and she calls herself the first boomer. So she's our flag bearer, and there's 78 million people coming out of that tunnel into retirement. So it's quite a scene. The majority are woefully prepared financially for what is facing them. I want to spotlight four key risks for all older adults in the short time. Longevity risk, inflation risk, health care risk, and exploitation risk. The biggest fear of the older adult is surprisingly not death. It's running out of money. Longevity risk, we've had the medical advances, people taking better care of themselves, mainly they're stopping smoking, and that means you, people are living years longer. A couple reaching 65 together today, there's more than a 50% chance that one of them will live past 90 years old. That's 25 more years of re in retirement on a fixed income principally. So consequently, inflation risk is real. Their fixed income buying power shrinks as the cost of everything they need to live rises over time. Their fixed income struggles to keep pace. The inflation rate experienced by seniors is also higher than that of the overall economy. The culprit is health care. It accounts for 13% of expenditures by Americans over the age of 65 compared to only 5% for all other age groups. The double whammy being that health care inflation historically has risen at double the inflation rate. So more percentage of their money is in health care, and it's rising at a faster rate. Some certified financial planners conservatively recommend in their retirement projections calculating 3% inflation for general spending, but 5 or 6% for health care. For retiring older adults, the accumulation stage comes to an end, and the distribution stage begins. It's all about what income is there going to be to live on. Social Security was never intended to be the largest part of an individual's income in retirement. Social Security is often the only income here in South Dallas. Home equity, uh, baby boomers are the first generation to reach retirement still owing mortgages. It's never happened in history before. For some older seniors, reverse mortgage is their only hope 
for staying alive and feeding themselves. And finally, exploitation risk. Older adult population has a target painted on their back. 70% of financial assets in this country are owned by 50 plus year olds with plenty of willing people and businesses wanting to take it away from them. They take advantage of an older adult's natural declining frontal lobe cognitive abilities as they age. One in 10 at age 65 and one in three at age 85 experience this. And it's bad enough the attacks from outsiders, ID theft, scammers, telephone solicitors, fraud, but unfortunately, 61% of the billions and billions of dollars lost by seniors each year are to people that are known to them, family, caregivers, and so-called friends. An example is mom is in memory care, daughter has her power of attorney, is out spending mom's money off not paying mom's bills, and uh, the facility eviction letter soon follows that we have to deal with. The internet access opened new portals of illegal entry into older adult lives, exposing these isolated, lonely, older adults to fake overseas lottery winnings just waiting to be picked up, uh, sweetheart scams, phishing schemes, of course, spell with a PH, and other frauds that seniors fall for. The list is lengthy. The dollar amounts lost are staggering. Surfing the internet is becoming increasingly dangerous, especially for the older adult. We have a saying at the EFSC that you thought taking dad's car away was tough. Wait till you have to take away his computer. But businesses also, let me give you an example. Ralph is a South Dallas 83-year-old man came to us, Social Security less than $900 a month. He responded to a $5 off coupon in the mail for an oil change at a dealership. Four hours later, he left with a new car loaded with every tire, maintenance, guarantee, extras imaginable, and a car payment well over $500 a month for the next seven years. There was no way he could even pay his rent and eat with that car payment. And he felt helpless to get his car back. And what was the dealership's response? He is an adult. He can make his own decisions. How did they even get that loan underwritten? How did they get that thing financed? Way below subprime, probably subterranean prime, if there is a few. But with relentless pressure and other threats, the Elder Financial Safety Center got them to take the new car back and return him to a status quo. Unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident here in South Dallas. The older population is also very vulnerable to predatory lending, payday loans, title loans, extraordinary fees and interest. We're partnering with St. Vincent de Paul on a mini loan program that consolidates these at 3%. At closing, we take the money and take the individual, driving them to each one of these payday lenders, paying off the loans, and they go through 12 months of intensive counseling. Credit card debt, not uncommon to find, and 80 plus year olds with 25,000 plus in credit card debt. Minimum payment only, no hope to ever be paid off. In conclusion, there's no surprise, money is primo gateway issue to older adults' public safety and security. It affects everything in their lives. So the four risks enumerated, longevity, inflation, healthcare, exploitation, crucial to the older adult going forward, stability of prices, and consumer protections, just to name a few. My time is up. I'd be happy to answer any questions about financial viability, financial vulnerability. I do have one question, Steve. The, uh, of your uh, clientele, what percentage of them have no savings at all? Uh, a large group. It's a different demographics. When you get up into the senior age, uh, majority of South Dallas people do not have any savings, nothing to fall back on. Uh, sometimes they own their house, and uh, that's good. So if they're in that situation, most typical piece of advice or issue you encounter when you run into a person with that profile? Well, we do a lot of uh, budgeting with them and counseling, coaching on how to make it. Uh, one thing here in St. Phillips, I I'm always pleased in South Dallas, I often run across people in their budget, there's their tithe, and I say, what's this $50? And they go, oh, that's my offering above my tithes. And uh, so there is this, that strong religious community down here, and that's always good. But uh, we just uh, make recommendations on where they can cut. A lot of times there's nowhere to cut, but okay. we're looking for benefits for them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for what you're doing. Next is Sarah. Sarah, you want to make your way up to the podium. Sarah is the Senior Manager, Partner Development for the North Texas Food Bank. North Texas Food Bank is a hunger relief organization that distributes donated, purchased, and prepared food through a network of more than 200 partners, agencies in 13 counties. It operates a community food pantry right here at St. Phillips. 
Sarah? Good morning. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, when I got the call to come today, I was a little surprised. Um, how's a girl who runs a food pantry going to talk about monetary policy? <laughs> but um, one of the things that has been really incredible in my experience working with our community pantry here next door to St. Phillips is um, the impact that we're able to see. Food opens the door. It builds rapport. It builds trust. And I think that that has been what we've really learned. So in 2014, we were asked to partner with St. Phillips and conduct um, kind of a learning laboratory in a client choice pantry here in South Dallas. We knew that this urban area was one of the highest in our service areas um, for food insecurity. And so we really were very interested. And when we began, we were really interested primarily in, in learning about our partner agencies. We have over 200 partner agencies in our 13 county service area. And we wanted to know how do we better serve them? Are we good partners to them? We also wanted to know volunteerism. We wanted to know about the clients that we're serving, um, efficiency, things that we could do to improve our model and to support our partners we were able to test so many of those things um, in our four years here. One of the wonderful things we were able to learn though, that we were also able to see firsthand here in South Dallas is that hunger is a symptom of a much larger problem. That means that it's really important for me to be partnering with all of my peers, to be partnering with St. Phillips to make sure that we are serving not only food every day, but connecting and serving um, those strong referrals to other agencies. We are able to also provide produce in a food desert area. So to have a food desert area that doesn't have um, much access to grocery stores or fresh produce, that means a lot of our clients that are seniors primarily and disabled adults are accessing most of their groceries at a local convenience store gas station. That is not a good balance, especially for the families that are living in our community, to know that we can provide access to a well-balanced meal for families and also access to four to six items of produce every other week for that family, that supplemental nutrition is huge for the community. It's not only huge because we know that diabetes is very prevalent in this area, but also because we know that by providing that fresh produce each day, that we're going to be changing the way that children learn how to eat. We're going to be changing the way they look at health. Some of the ways we've tested that here is by providing recipes. Here in our community pantry, we've provided recipe cards that only have maybe four or five ingredients where you're able to um, cook a product that you can get all the items here at the pantry. We're also um, just providing education. I always tell a story about butternut squash because the first time we got it in a pantry, I myself had never prepared it before. So when people were saying, what do you do with this? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I can access my mobile phone or I can get on a computer pretty easily, but for some of my clients that is a huge challenge. So to be able to just provide a very simple card on how to, how to prepare this um, in a microwave, how to prepare it in a stove, in an oven, what kind of item you would need. I mean, some people are not even accessing the utensils that they need to be able to cook. So how do you open a butternut squash if you don't have a sharp knife? Something very simple like that and providing directions um, to be able to take people through those steps so they're able to actually use the food that we're providing them. That's something that's huge. Another wonderful thing we've been able to test is that we've been bringing services into the pantry. If you know that you need access to food and that you're going to be there every other week, then we would like to welcome some of our partners in to be able to assist with other needs and enrolling people in benefits. We brought in our nutritionists uh, from the North Texas Food Bank to be able to do um, a kind of special session where they're able to walk through privately during the hours that were closed with a client and to talk to them about what does low sodium mean? What is low sugar? Maybe we won't know that when we're just reading the back of a can or uh, you know, even something very simple as the difference in how to prepare um, white rice versus brown rice. This is a big change for us. 
our SSA team, which is our um, social service team, is able to also connect people with the benefits that they need to enroll for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as Food Stamps. Being able to combine all of these um, is a huge thing for us because we know that transportation is very challenging. Even though people might say, but there, you know, there is a Fiesta or a Minyards, but it's only five minutes away, or can you know, the clients drive to Uptown and go utilize a Walmart? Sometimes that is just not an option. Getting a few blocks just to our pantry down the street can be really challenging for um, specifically our, our clients that are in wheelchairs, our clients that really don't have access at all. And so knowing that and understanding, we've been able to gather a lot of information about what our clients need and how to better partner with a lot of our community agencies that have wraparound services, as well as a lot of just our nonprofit organizations in the area, educating them about what we have as needs and bringing them in to offer those to our client. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions? So how underserved, this, this pantry does a fantastic job and always impressed every time I see it. How underserved though is this community? How many more pantries like this are needed? Um, so surprisingly, it's just about distributing them really around the right area. So when we talk about transportation, um, you know, City Square is not far at all. It's about five minutes from here. It's really about making sure that we have access in our, our pantries around the area because surprisingly, you know, some of our rural communities and our service area actually have less resources. There are resources here. It's just a huge challenge to get there. So I would say the barrier really isn't providing that food, but it's getting the access to know about it and to know how to get there and to be able to utilize it. And if you could increase the size or put three more of these, uh, if you feel that, what, what's yeah. the constraint? Is, uh, is it money or what is the constraint? I would say specifically for our pantry, uh, we just know that it's, it's space. So we are operating in a building that is, you know, set up like a grocery store and it's great. We have a lot more space and we've been blessed to have walk-in and reach-in refrigeration, but still the need in South Dallas specifically in this area is so large that just last week, we enrolled 30 new clients. If we're doing that every week, I mean, it shows right there what that need is and what we need space. Okay, All right. thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, my panel's gonna really be upset with me because I feel like we should go to transportation next. What do you think? Are you ready? Okay, good. I'll just jump around because it's the spirit that moves me. <laughs> <laughs> Shaylin Scott's gonna be up next. She's the regional director of, the North, of North Texas On the Road Lending. On the Road Lending provides vehicle selection assistance and long-term financial mentoring to help low-income individuals and families overcome transportation barriers so they can get to work and avoid predatory lending. On the Road Lending helps people improve their credit and purchase fuel-efficient, reliable cars, financing them through a private equity loan fund with a low-cost loan. Jane. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for having me. And this is, I was so happy to hear transportation from everybody along the lines. That is such a huge issue in the area. Um, in particular, um, on the road lending is one that provides fuel efficient, affordable, and reliable vehicles to families through what we call character based lending. Um, and it's our mission to help those families to do that so they can get out of that cycle of poverty and debt and not be taken advantage of by predatory lending, like some of you have mentioned. But just to give you an idea, I'll talk a little bit about our character-based program, but just to give you an idea about how important reliable transportation is, with a show of hands, how many of you have a car? Pretty much everyone. And how many of you drive your car to work every day? Pretty much anyone. Now, think if you do not have that vehicle, it's gone, you don't have a replacement, how many of you would find it difficult, if not impossible, to get to work every single day? Exactly. People do not think about transportation until it's gone. It's always there. It fits so seamlessly into our lives, we don't even realize it. And when it comes to transportation, it is literally the engine that drives our ability to work, to go to school, 
to get to the grocery store, to maintain our lives. And what's currently available is not enough. That's why at On the Road Lending, we're so keenly interested in how the actions of the Fed impact access to credit and the interest rates. And in addition to the Fed's domain, there are opportunities for legislative policies and that can help the low-income families as well. And we want to make sure that we welcome the discussion not just with those in public policy, but with the community at large. You have a huge stake in what is brought into the area. At On the Road Lending, we have the tendency to work specifically with our clients on what works and what doesn't work. And we want to make sure that it reflects what the community needs. If you didn't know, surprisingly, here in North Texas, we have the largest mass transit system in North America, if you didn't know that, in terms of linear light rail miles. But Dallas is not an island. It's not a standalone city. It's a part of this vast region that's growing and just exploding everywhere, as I'm sure you know of. So with the amount of region that we must serve to get from employment, to get to our daycares, to get to our churches, what we currently have is not feasible. There is not a system that can serve the vast majority of the things that us as families and individuals need. So understandably, there's a disconnect. And then on top of that, Dallas has what's called this spatial mismatch. You have lower income families, and you have higher opportunity jobs in neighborhoods in completely different areas. And neither one of those are served, if at all, by mass transit. So what's left? You can look around here in the neighborhood, neighborhoods close to you, uh, especially there are a lot in South Dallas. You can find cars, you can find cash cars, you can find dealerships on every corner, tote the note lots, they're there. And people may ask, why not just go there? Why not just get a car there and see what happens? But there's a value for those who are low to moderate income to have a vehicle. But it's not just any car. You need a vehicle that has a warranty, that fits your budget, that fits your need, that doesn't put you in a deeper hole than when you started. What's the sense of getting into a vehicle if you are, as one person had just mentioned, you're paying more than you need to? It's costing you more. It's hitting your budget more than needed. So there's this incorrect assumption that low-income families can't afford a vehicle. That's not true. If it's the right one that fits their needs and budget, they can. It's an incorrect assumption that having a vehicle is not an asset because it depreciates. That's incorrect as well, too. If you have a family that has a vehicle that is affordable, reliable, they maintain the maintenance on the vehicle. This is an asset for our families in the future. And as I'm sure a lot of you here in the room know, asset poverty is huge. It is a huge barrier for families, not just in South Dallas, but across the nation. Through our character-based lending program, we've proven that families can save over $10,000 over the life of their loan just in interest alone by working with our program. Now that's huge. You have tote the note lots on every corner that can charge you up to 27% interest on a vehicle. How can you get out of that if you are charged 27% interest? It's literally impossible. This is why we know that a number of families are vulnerable to predatory lending, especially in this area, and they may not even know it. If you have poor credit and some people may not even know what poor credit is. Subprime is 525 or less. This is what we're looking at. A number of families in the region have those credit scores. So they are not getting your 2% interest on a car. They're not getting 7% interest on a car. They're getting 24, 27% interest on a vehicle. And we're expecting them to be able to survive. How? So on top of that, you have to believe that there's something better. Right now, interest rates are rising, and it was just identified. The Fed there in New York recently reported that 7 million Americans are 90 days or more past due on their auto loans. So that's not just the low-moderate-income families. 
That's a lot of Americans who are unable to do what they need to do. And as people's um, performances are starting to deteriorate, their credit is deteriorating, which leads to this endless cycle as well. So we need to give them the opportunity to have credit building loans such as ours to offset this, and as well to access employment and uh, jobs and all the things that our families need to do. And much like our reputation, credit can be destroyed overnight. Just like that, it's very simple. It takes a decade or more to even rebuild it. And even though it's been seven years ago since the recession, we still have neighbors that are struggling to rebuild their lives their credit, and here recently, even with Hurricane Harvey, you have those who are rebuilding their lives and credit as well. So when we help people to overcome these financial choices and decisions, as well as catastrophic events, it's this intervention that can save them not just money, but struggle over the lifetime of their loans or whatever it is that they're doing in life, how they want to succeed. We have to overcome a lot of challenges, and we can do that we can overcome food deserts, we can help to overcome employment gaps, lack of access, all of those things simply if people have a way to get there. If they do not have a way to get there, it's all for naught. You have an employment job program. I'm running low. Running low. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. You see, I can just talk, I know talk, it. talk. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. So, Shayla, I am going to ask. So, exactly. How do you help them exactly? If you're 525 or less, I come to you yes. and I need a vehicle. Yes, we are able to help the families that traditional banks are unable to. How do you do it? We do what's called wraparound services. We provide financial education for our families. Yep. We help them with coaching and mentoring. We're the ones that provide them with the low interest loan, regardless of what's on their credit. You'll extend the loan? Yes. Our designated CDFI provides the loan, and, and everyone pays the same interest rate, 9.75%. 9.75, mm -hmm. and it's secured by the car? Yes. And you're getting your funding from where? We have a private equity loan fund that works in conjunction with our nonprofit. And who is providing that? The loan fund is a combination of community investors, banks, individuals, whomever want to see the community itself uh, grow. So these families who ordinarily wouldn't be able to accept a loan or get a loan with decent terms, those funds are used specifically for our families. And that's good. I'm quite just go, go on a little further because I'm curious about the model, uh, which sounds intriguing. The, is, can they earn, have they been able historically to earn ex, a, acceptable return on equity, your investors? Yes, it's 3.25. 3.25 stays in the loan fund, 3.25 goes to the investors, and 3.25 goes to the nonprofit for sustainability. So the model works? Yes, sir. It's recycling capital. Okay, yeah. that's great. In, All right. in fact, the model works so well, other states are now. Yes, we're in Texas, you, Alabama, they? Mississippi, yeah. and Georgia. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I really jumped around. Pastor, I'm going to have you close. We're going to finish this up and take us home. So that means I'm going to go to Donald Wesson, who's the president of Baylor Scott & White Health and Wellness Center. Baylor Scott & White Health, the largest not-for-profit health care system in Texas, includes 48 hospitals and more than 800 patient care sites. It operates clinics in South Dallas, including one soon to open at St. Philip's. Well, first of all, let me extend thanks to the Fed for inviting the wisdom of the community and the leaders that serve it. Let me begin with the recommendations that I would have, and I'm going to end with those recommendations. First of all, the encouragement is to invest in health resources that will complete the currently incomplete health recipe. The health recipe is health care, healthy nutrition, and healthy physical activity. And we ask that you facilitate investment in these additional resources to health care, most notably healthy nutrition and healthy physical activity, and invest in existing models that are already showing success. And in our institution at the Juanita J. Craft Recreation Center, in partnering with Baylor Scott & White Health, we are demonstrating such success. 
One of the questions that we were asked to address was that looking to the South Dallas area that your clinic serves, what do you see are the most pressing community needs for regarding health and health care? I love that question because it gives us the opportunity to make a distinction between two concepts that are often rolled into one, health care and health. So health care or services provided by professionals like me as a physician, nurses, others uh, who are trained in the health profession who provide these services to individuals that come to us. Health, on the other hand, is a broader concept of overall well-being. And there are many components that contribute to health. And we at the Health and Wellness Center say, just like the old African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child, we say it takes a village to do health. Because there are many components that go into health, most notably healthy nutrition and increased physical activity. So the the ultimate goal is health, and that's the investment that we ask that we facilitate investment in. Speaking of health care, studies show it contributes only about 20% to overall health. 60% is contributed by correctable environmental factors, most importantly, that includes healthy nutrition and healthy physical activity. That's why we need those other two components to complete that recipe for health. Poverty limits access to all three ingredients for that health re uh, recipe. It limits uh, access to health care, to access to healthy nutrition, and access to resources that support increased physical activity. So a lack of investment in an infrastructure that provides these supporting elements to health care is devastating to the health of uh, poverty communities. One question that was asked was, what economic factors most affect access to health care? You've already heard a number of them. Well, first of all, high unemployment limits access to employee-based insurance that can finance health care. But it also limits the funds that are necessary to purchase the health services that are uh, available. And one of the things that we've learned in South Dallas is that despite the availability of a number of outpatient clinics that can provide the health care portion of that recipe, transportation limits our residents being able to get to much of that health care. And so our focus then is on those missing two ingredients of the health recipe, most notably healthy nutrition and increased physical activity. So one question that we were asked is, how does changes in unemployment rates and price levels broadly affect community health and access to health and health care? Well, you've already heard me talk about health. The increased unemployment increases poverty and limits those access to those three ingredients for the health recipe. It also uh, limits the resources that our residents have to be able to acquire the resources necessary to support health. Not just health care, but healthy nutrition and healthy physical activity. So unemployment then contributes in a mighty way. And as you know, unemployment is a real challenge in our community. So let me get back to the recommendations in terms of the focus of investment. Our encouragement is that non-healthcare entities co-invest with healthcare entities like mine to complete the components that are necessary for that health recipe. That includes not just the health care that our organizations, health system organizations, have already invested in, but the additional complementary uh, services and resources, increased nutrition uh, and healthy nutrition and increased physical activity. This investment opportunity for non-health care systems is the open opportunity uh, to invest in health. And these, there are already successful models for this in South Dallas. And so there's no need to reinvent the wheel. This investment will grease the existing wheel to have it roll forward. And then finally, this investment will yield 
improved health in our community that will then allow individuals to contribute to the economic viability of their families, of their communities, and of our city and state. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Donald. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. I, I guess I have to ask you, so the ecosystem you talked about, not just health, but nutrition, uh, exercise, transportation, that ecosystem you yes. described, how is Dallas doing versus other cities in the United States? Are we in the middle? Do we lag? How do we, how do we rate? So first of all, let me correct that word exercise. We don't use that four letter physical word. Physical activity. We say physical okay. activity. That's a good one, okay. So I stand corrected. So secondly, Dallas actually has the opportunity that many other cities don't have. We have 43 recreation centers scattered yeah. around the city. And so what we do at the Health and Wellness Center is overlay the resources of a clinic and the overlay the resources of healthy nutrition on top of it. However, there is not sufficient investment to do that. We need more um, farm stands that provide this food, and it's important not just the food, but it right. has to be connected with education regarding nutrition and connected with the health care. So we're talking about a value chain here. It's not just food here. It's not just increased physical activity here. It is wrapping them together in a value chain for that health recipe such that the, these, uh, the healthy nutrition and increased physical activity is teamed with the health care. So I have to ask, because we do a lot of convening to address these issues, who would we go to, who would you go to, to try to improve that? To improve that? What you just described. We say we need more new farm stands, nutrition, counseling, right, bundled. We Which, need, well, well, actually it is the government agencies then who would help convene those three So if, you want, if we want to improve that, who do we go talk to to improve that? The, well, first of all, you can talk with me. Okay. <laughs> and then you we're will. Convening, we're convening the resources okay. uh, together. So okay. we, we have a food distributor that we convene. Okay. We have a and the biggest uh, impediment rec you, recreation center that we work and with. And the biggest impediment you face to doing what you're trying to do is what? Is lack of investment in these existing successful resources. So you need investors, funders? To support more farm stands, okay. to support more clinics and recreation centers to support more education in our community as to how those three resources link together for health. And would you ask of the three, for-profit, philanthropy, government money, where do you think that investment's likely to come from? The greater investment is coming from, uh, for, for, for us now, is from for-profit. That's where we're, uh, okay. I, I, that we're getting from companies that are interested in reducing things like uh, absenteeism Got it. And, and increasing presenteeism, they see the advantage of these additional health care resources that then reduce, improve health and reduce those things that contribute to their bottom line. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Next. I thought this would be a good ending to kind of tie all these things together that you're going to talk about, don't you? That was brilliant of me, wasn't it, Chris? <laughs> I'd like to introduce Pastor Chris Simmons. He's the pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church and its Community Development Corporation. Cornerstone CDC leads community development and revitalization efforts in South Dallas and Fair Park. And it's in partnership with the city of Dallas. Cornerstone CDC has purchased abandoned properties for use in building new affordable homes. Thank you so much. It is truly an honor to be here and talking about the need for affordable housing and people moving back into the neighborhood because we all know that if we don't have people, then a lot of the services that we have heard talked about today would not be necessary. Statistics show that in our particular neighborhood in South Dallas Fair Park uh, community that we have had a hemorrhage over 54% of residents since 1970. And so as a result of the large exodus of many residents, um, it has caused the erosion of a tax base that is linked to large amounts of vacant land. And a lot of that land uh, is in our neighborhood, uh, upwards in our area of 70 to 80%. And so again, 
missing out on a large tax base that uh, our city could take advantage of. Many of those factors are related directly to poverty, and again, as we look at statistically, uh, in our neighborhoods in the South Dallas Fair Park community, we have a medium household income that is below the state average. We have men, uh, medium house values that is significantly also uh, below state values. We have a large number of renters, and so very low home ownership. And then also the challenge of us having and dealing with significantly aging housing stock. In fact, as you look at our housing stock, according to the census, out of 7,584 households, the majority of those were built prior to 1939. We also, um, according to the census, since 2014, we've only had 163 brand new uh, single family households being built. And so there's a large need for new homes being built in this community that uh, are affordable. One of the questions that was posed to us uh, in preparation was, what are some of the economic factors that influence the availability of affordable housing units in the community? And one of those would be the economic growth. As we look at the central business district growing and the uh, push out to the surrounding communities that uh, are becoming populated now with uh, individuals purchasing homes, those that has now begun to spill over into communities that were once blighted and many individuals did not want to have anything to uh, do with. And so in the name of urban renewal, many people hear urban removal. That as individuals are moving into their neighborhood, they see themselves being pushed out. And one of the challenges of the community is always having to fight with developers coming in, wanting to build homes that are really out of their price range without consideration that the more expensive those homes are, uh, the higher their tax, tax base will be. And as we've mentioned and heard with many of our seniors who are living on very tight resources and budgets, the increase of their tax base and taxable uh, tax homes causes major, major challenges. Another issue and challenge is interest rates. And although we uh, are in an environment where there are lower interest rates, we have found that many of the individuals in the community do not have access to uh, credit. And part of the challenge is them having, not having access to credit is because many of them, many of the residents had their credit destroyed when they were very, very young. Many of their parents felt that in order to have utilities turned on in their name, children's name, they used their children's social security numbers and then they did not pay those bills and so those children enter into adulthood with already damaged uh, credit. Another challenge that we have seen in the community is the issue of supply and demand with fewer uh, houses with individuals uh, wanting to remain in the community means that the houses that are available uh, go at a more uh, expensive housing price. And so uh, as we have less homes being available, the higher the prices are for those homes. And so a lot of individuals are having to be are moving out of the central business or near the central business district and with jobs being further out provides various, various challenges. Another issue uh, in our community as we talk about affordable housing is in our neighborhood we have very outdated infrastructure and as we look at the need to upgrade infrastructure if that need is tacked on to the cost of the home that presents various challenges for the homeowner and so that homeowner therefore is not able to um, afford, afford that home. One of the questions that was uh, posed was among the factors that are key, um, a key concern of the feds related to um, is the changes in job market, interest rates, or, inf or inflation, which one would most impact accessibility to affordable housing in South Dallas, to which I believe it, it has a lot to do with job market. In our neighborhoods, we have very few 
uh, jobs available that provide a livable wage to many of the residents here. Statistics says that 1% of the jobs available in Dallas are in South Dallas, which means that there, is a there are very few opportunities for individuals to uh, go to work and be able to support their families. In fact, um, WINS, which is a uh, nonprofit uh, standing for working in neighborhoods uh, strategically, said that South Dallas has a 16.5% unemployment rate. And this was done in uh, 2012, where in Dallas then it was only 5.1%. And so a large number of unemployment in this particular uh, neighborhood. Um, we also find ourselves in this community dealing with the working poor, individuals who give many many hours, but their wages just cannot keep up with the pace. And so they find themselves really struggling to make ends meet. Someone has uh, said it, it is like having the money and the resources to eat at a fast food restaurant, but all that's available in your community are five-star restaurants. And so prevents various challenges in, in our neighborhood. And so we are very appreciative of the nonprofits that are available in the neighborhood and those who are willing to work with uh, nonprofits, and particularly uh, the work of the Real Estate Council, working with nonprofits like Cornerstone and various other nonprofits, bringing us together to make affordable housing accessible um, to the community. I'll close with a quote from a news article that was written. Uh, last year in the Dallas Morning News, and the title was "Dallas is failing to build enough affordable housing in uh, affordable housing, and decent, hardworking families are hurting." They conclude, "We can improve the situation by welcome, welcoming moderately priced homes into our towns and neighborhoods. We could." allow builders to scatter well-designed duplexes and triplexes in upscale areas instead of more 4,000 square foot single families homes. We could view affordable housing <clears throat> as infrastructure, something vital to our long-term economic and community health and, in, and invest significant public and philanthropic dollars into it. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. So, any, any thoughts or follow-up before you sit down? We're going to, we might come back to this Richard, whole panel. Richard has one. Oh, Richard has one. Well, really, just for the all, all I have some comments on the entire, on the entire panel. Okay. So, do I do that later? Yes. Or do that? We'll do that in a moment. Okay. Um, why don't you do, why don't we take a few minutes to, I was going to do Q&A, so while people are thinking of their questions, uh, if you have some reflections on what you've heard. Well, thank you. This has really been uh, very useful uh, for me to hear uh, a range of, of, of your perspectives. Uh, and I thought what I might do is, is tie this in to, to some of the things that we think about at the Fed, because it's actually quite, quite relevant. Um, the, the Fed is, uh, is, is unique among the world's major central banks um, in that it has explicitly, by chartered by Congress, we have explicitly a dual mandate. We have, we have two jobs we've got to do well. And one is to, to run a policy that uh, achieves and sustains maximum employment, uh, and the other piece is, is price stability. Um, most of the other central banks in the world have one job, which is to keep inflation low. And, and we're different, and I, we think that's an important uh, difference. And what I've heard a lot today from many of you is the value of having uh, a robust, healthy uh, labor market. Uh, and indeed, the evidence shows that as the unemployment rate for the whole country falls, it is disadvantaged groups, folks with lesser education, that tend to benefit more in, in what we sometimes call a hot labor market. Uh, so that, you, 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 that resonates uh, with me. The other thing I heard that was quite interesting uh, here is some of the success stories about providing access to transportation. And I know there's always more that can, that can be done, but I think this is a broader problem in our country is that the people aren't where the jobs are. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in the aggregate data in the U.S. that's actually quite encouraging is that 
the participation rates, those folks who are entering the labor market, have been going up recently. And a lot of folks several years ago thought that that process had come to an end. I think part of it, I don't know how much, is because there is some success in matching workers to jobs. And, and more efforts along those lines could have a benefit not only in your community, but, but more broadly. And then the third thing I'd say, of course, is that the other part of our mandate is low and stable inflation. And especially for folks who are retired and whatever that those 75 uh, million folks in the baby boom, and I'm in that group uh, uh, as well, uh, for, you know, for many of them, uh, you know, high inflation is a real problem because they're on limited savings, they have limited source of, of income. And so what, what Rob and I and our colleagues face in our jobs is trying to achieve both of those worthy goals, and, um, and, and that is the focus. So this has been very helpful for me to hear your individual perspectives and the way that they do uh, relate to what we're trying to accomplish, not only with our policy, but in this, in this review that we're doing. So, so thank you very much for that. Ready for Q&A? Let's take some questions. Let's take some questions from the audience. And by the way, bef um, there might, I need you to go to the mics because we're live. Did I tell you we're live streaming? <laughs> Um, so if you have a question, you need to line up behind right the mics. To mic. um, and just out of curiosity, for how many of you are with community-based organizations in the room? Okay. And how many are you um, with businesses? Uh, you're an employer. Um, philanthropy. Grant makers. Okay. That gives other. <laughs> All right. If you could tell us your name. I'm Rusty Dworkin, and I'm a volunteer board member with Miles of Freedom, which is an organization that Tavius uh, represented today most capably. Question I have for the Federal Reserve Bank is, we talk about policy and we talk about that at a national level. Even though Fed Reserve Bank of Dallas is in Dallas, it's still part of a national umbrella. The challenge we have is microeconomic. The challenge we have is, how does somebody get from Dolphin Street to, um, oh, let's say George Bush, a you know, a 25-mile commute to a job? How does the Federal Reserve Bank help join the local community as it serves the national um, mandates? So I'll tell. So one of the beauties of the system. Federal Reserve System is there's 12 reserve banks, and I can tell you in the in the 11th district in this district, we are actively involved in the in the local communities all throughout this state and the parts of New Mexico and Louisiana that we serve. So we have a very sizable what's called regional group, and we spend an enormous amount of time locally. So it's not unusual, and Richard has heard this. When I go to uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, I might I I might share. And a lot of my colleagues will also share some of the local issues that we're facing. So we talk a lot about, for example, uh, from this district, uh, the amount of poverty, which is unusually high, the transportation issues, the child care issues, the, many of the other what I call structural, you call them micro, but we call them micro structural issues that are affecting participation in the workforce, GDP, education, and all the things that help build a healthy economy. So I think that's one of the benefits of having a distributed Federal Reserve System is we spend a lot of time sharing with each other what we're learning locally. And then turning those into dollars or turning those into local opportunities? Well, it's, it, there's two ways we do that. Number one, and, and Richard commented on it, we have allowed uh, it's one, of the, it's one of the factors that's gone, at least to my thinking, and I think Mine others, too. Richard, comment, on letting the economy run a little hotter with the thought being, I think inflation is, is more under control, but also we're aware of these structural issues, the extent we have a better employment market, it might create a bit of a tailwind to solve some of these local issues. And then the second thing we do is we have a big community outreach effort. So I don't just sit up here and, and listen and talk about these issues. Uh, for those who know me, Dr. Flower is a good example. We get actively into the community and we convene groups to try to solve them. We're very, might surprise you, very action oriented. So we do research on these issues, we convene groups, but then we'll, we'll get together groups, see if maybe if we can help 
uh, uh, help with a solution. So what's an example? In McAllen, Texas, they lack Wi-Fi. We work with the mayor and local officials to actually get Wi-Fi done in McAllen, Texas. That would be an example of a micro issue where we just don't sit and observe. We get involved and see if we can help be a catalyst to make improvements. Terrific. Thank, thank I'd you. like to know more at another time. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite you to our website, too, dallasfed.org, because you could read about some of the things that we're doing in communities around the district. Over here, we have a question. Yes. My name is Catherine LeBlanc, and I'm a founder of Catch Up and Read, which is providing after-school reading intervention and teacher training at 12 Dallas area ISD schools throughout uh, Dallas. And today has been most valuable because we really focus on the needs of the whole child. And if that child has stressors, they cannot be in a condition to learn. So my question really is about affordable housing today. And I'm wondering if there is a city, a lot of large cities have dealt with gentrification. And I'm wondering if there is a city that has been a model in how to handle that. I might be able to help you with that. <laughs> That's all right. Gentrification is a really difficult uh, subject uh, to discuss uh, and to, to unpack. There are a couple of different examples across the country on what cities are doing to um, address that. So in our, I hate to tell you this, but on our website, we have lots of examples of different, the way different cities are handling that. The ultimate goal is to try to get people to opportunity. And so when in mixed income neighborhoods, the research has shown is really one of the most successful ways to do that. And so, but how to do that? Um, there's a sort of a zero, sometimes people think of it as a zero sum game where I don't want to give up anything and therefore I'm not uncomfortable with having other people come in. Um, there's NIMBYism, there's all kinds of issues around gentrification, but there's some good examples on our website on, on how you can see how communities are, are working around those issues. And there's some people in the room that are actually doing some of that and work I, And I well. might comment, one of the lessons we've learned, remember I've lived in other parts of the country, East Coast, and we talk a lot with the mayor, including this morning, about this issue. One of the keys, because this is, this is really a tough issue, you just can't leave it to private capital. Uh, because you have constraints uh, that, and we talked about what the risk is if you don't make sure that people who are living there can be included. I used to be on the board of the Ford Foundation. We spent an enormous amount of time I did in Detroit, which has really got this issue and is trying to go through a rebuilding. But I think the one lesson I've learned, which is hard, it takes collaboration between city agencies, private sector, community leaders, and so that takes leadership. And, and I don't think there's anyone who thinks this is not a very difficult issue, but the best progress I've seen has been made, and I know the mayor is working on, on doing this, and we agree, is getting all the constituencies to collaborate and think of the whole. Um, but that's why this is so challenging, I think. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, and thank you for your time and attention, and thank the, uh, the community service organizations as well. Um, one of the themes that I've heard, starting with the creed, but literally every single comment is creating hope or eliminating things that quash the hope, mm -hmm. and then all these great things happen once we have that. Um, my question is about uh, the underbanked and unbanked population um, and what the Fed can do to, to address that. Uh, roughly 8 to 10 percent of uh, families in the United States are unbanked, another 10 to 15 percent. I don't know the statistics, but I think if you look uh, at our community, uh, those numbers would be significantly higher in South Dallas, significantly lower in North Dallas. Um, I have a savings account, I have a mortgage, I have things that make me attractive to a bank, so therefore I can write checks for free. Uh, and I use my bank account quite a bit for people who don't have those economic advantages, they are paying an extraordinary premium uh, to post offices, to uh, convenience stores, to bank checks, uh, to pay their day in, day out bills. And it occurs to me this is just a awful, awful tax, uh, indirect tax on the most vulnerable aspects. What can the Fed do to first of all study that, publicize that, uh, but then also encourage financial institutions uh, to uh, uh, really engage and address that? 
So I make a comment because we actually do a lot of work on this in this district. We, we back a nonprofit called, called, called Raise Texas, and we do a conference typically every year on this subject. Uh, and the Fed generally across the country does research on this. But, it's, but this unbanked goes with poverty, lack of nutrition, lack of access, underemployment. All, the, all this is part of that whole issue. Uh, and so uh, lack of Wi-Fi, by the way, is part of it also. And so uh, we might, I might direct you, we do a lot of work and write a lot about this and maybe even uh, if you're involved in this, we'd invite you to our, we do a conference on this and I forget when that is, Alfreda, this year? Alfreda, when yes. is that conference this year? We just had it in December. It's every two years. Okay, the organization. Every two years. So we'll do it again, uh, but we do, we, we, this is a big focus. We don't, we don't, we don't pretend to have the magic bullet, but we spent a lot of time drawing attention to it because it's part of all these issues uh, affecting underserved groups. And, and by the way, the reason for everybody we're so focused on this, GDP in this country is made up of growth in the workforce and growth in productivity. And what we found is to the extent groups are underserved, they're less likely to be in the workforce right. and their education levels are likely to be lower and they're likely, less likely to be as productive, and that means lower GDP growth in this country. And, uh, and, and when we talk about it that way, these things are all investments as opposed to uh, relying on the goodwill of the communities. These are investments. We need higher growth in this country, and these are all contributors to that. That's why we spend so much time on it. That connects all these issues to what, with what we do. Yeah, I might direct you to it's. It's an organization called Raise Texas, and it's also it's a, na a statewide conversation about asset building, and the importance of getting people into the financial mainstream. Really good work is being done, and I would encourage you to see about the different streams that are working. And then collectively, bankers are having conversations. We uh, convene bankers to talk about having products and services that are accessible for low and moderate income individuals. We'll take one question over here. Sure. And I'd like to. I'd like to recognize our, <laughs> our leaders in the community. If you could uh, sure. tell us in your name. My, my name is Clay Jenkins. I'm the Dallas County Judge. I always learn a lot from listening, so thanks for uh, putting this together. A uh, couple of things I, in listening that I want to make sure that the folks are aware of. In Dallas County, we have a new Dallas County Health and Human Services Director. We're going to focus this year on sexual health. We're going to look at trying to make Dallas a fast-track county. Um, um, for HIV, improve those delivery services there, and then working with the city of Dallas and a host of private partners, we're gonna look at teen pregnancy and STIs. So anything that your nonprofits can join in on uh, with us, that also is that group that, that uh, the chairman talked about, um, CPAL, the Center for uh, you know, Child Poverty Action Lab, where we're all uh, working together. That's a focus of ours there as well. So uh, Baylor, Scott, and Wyatt, and those of you who are uh, dealing with health, uh, get with uh, Dr. Huang. Um, another thing that I wanted to make sure that you all are aware of is uh, my office, along with Workforce Solutions and DISD, is starting a, a program here the next month, and I, I think it's limited to five elementary schools in the Pleasant Grove area. But uh, we're looking for help from the community for this. We're looking to identify parents who are working, single parents probably working, and they're not making a very good wage, and, and coach them into getting a better job with the, the same skill set. So uh, if there's anything you can do to help us with that. And then my question is, um, I serve as the chief elected officer for our Workforce Solutions Board. So that thing I just mentioned is one of the things we're doing. What have you seen other workforce solutions type boards in the country doing that we're not doing here that we could uh, do to make uh, our workforce more vibrant and create more jobs in South Dallas? So maybe I'll, I'll start. So there are a number of areas that you've probably heard me criticize Dallas and Texas where we're behind the rest of the country in some areas. This is one area I think we are actually doing an uh, outstanding job in that what's the key for a workforce board? Working with high schools and junior colleges and going and interviewing businesses in the community, understanding where the job openings are, 
and then backward integrating into a curriculum as opposed to pushing a curriculum and saying this is what you should want. And I've been extremely impressed in Houston, absolutely Joe May in Dallas Community College. We do, we, we do a very, actually I think we do a very good job relative to other places in the country in forming that, that, that process and backward integrating into curriculum. But I think that's still the key lesson is you gotta start with, worker mobility is, is historically low. So you've gotta identify the jobs that are there in the community and then train the population that exists to take those jobs. And the, the second part, which was talked about, we probably lag here though on transportation and childcare support. So once people, take, if they get trained, can they get to the job? And I'd say that's the part we lag in. Yeah, and we're running, so just to answer, follow up on that, we've also did a study of all the workforce boards in the, in the state, actually, and found out that the, really the best solutions are local solutions with as many people around the table as possible. So not just workforce businesses and community-based organizations as well, really work well. We call them sector partnerships. So just to wrap up, what I'm gonna ask the last two people to do is I'm gonna take both questions, and if you could just give them to me one, two, and then we'll see if we can answer them. So we'll start. Okay, my name is Jesse Morris. As a layman, okay, listen to all of you. You are incredible. But could you form an umbrella and then get the information to the people? Because that is the problem. Um, as um, buying a home, Echo, part of Dallas, uh, it, it was word of mouth. No one is getting the information to the people. So you have the help, you want to help, get the information to us. Thank you. Because we will do it. Thank you. Yes. Okay, my name, my name is Linda Preston. I have two questions. One is um, with regard to infrastructure. Has the Fed, um, or can I just perhaps word it this way, what is the Fed's um, position on investment in rural broadband as well as underserved communities? One of the issues that we talked about earlier in infrastructure that informs affordable housing, small business development, a lot of times companies don't come into communities because the infrastructure can't support, the broadband can't support. Right now there are a lot of initiatives that the USDA is putting out to encourage um, partnerships that will bring and deliver broadband to rural and underserved communities. How can we inform our banks and encourage our banks to invest more with community-based um, co-ops, partnerships, so that underserved communities, impoverished communities can be a part of that picture? And then my second question is about consumer access to credit. I'd like to know, has the Fed ever considered or are there any discussions with regard to policy about um, repairing credit? Are we looking at how our credit bureaus, you know, if? I think the example was a family, um, their children was impacted for years because the families made bad decisions and used their social security information. It just seems punitive that you have to wait seven years often sometimes to get things fixed. And I think if that could be part of the national discussion. You know, it's not even just about access, but it's about redemption. How do we come back from that? How come it takes so long? You want to comment on that, Richard, or I can comment? Okay. So um, let, me, let me take these in order. First of all, um, so, so Richard went through the introduction. We're doing Federal Reserve listens because we want to improve. And so to your point, and I think your message is to all of us here, this sounds great, but how come you haven't heard more about it? And I do think, uh, I think that's when we're going to put our thinking caps on, actually, after we leave. And I know how we currently communicate, and we think we try to over-communicate, but what you're telling us is you're not doing a good enough job, right? And, and we need to improve. So let's agree, we'll go back, and maybe one of the good things that come out of this, I don't know what the answer is, but we need to find ways to communicate this more broadly and, and, give, uh, and help others do it. Okay, so I agree with that. And this is one of the reasons we're doing today, but we, well, I'll take it as a homework assignment. We have to figure out how to do this better, and I think rather than give you a quick answer, we may actually go back and do some thinking on this. On the second issue on broadband, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we take actually the broad, Texas is 
one of the states in the country that's got a number of areas when we do a heat map, we have a number of areas, particularly across the border, but others uh, where we lack broadband and we think that's integral to education, every issue we've talked about today, it's really hard to do it today without broadband. So we've actually gone out there and worked with mayors, nonprofits, banks through CRA and others uh, to try to actually do something about it. And I guess I would say to the extent you see areas in the state, in our district, that you think are underpenetrated, I'm not just saying we should do this, call us. And we're actually happy with anybody here to partner and we've got a team actually who's been through it before. We actually know how to do this after having been through it. We'll actually be glad to partner with you and see if we can help be a catalyst to get some of these areas that don't have Wi-Fi, um, greater Wi-Fi. On the consumer access issue, I, I wish I had a brilliant answer. We do, we do lots of work on the household sector and consumer access and consumer finance. Um, and, and I'd say we're a little careful at the Fed uh, not to be proposing structural solutions, but we do a lot of research that highlights this issue, um, and we'll continue to do that uh, to try to work with other constituencies that can do something about this. We agree it's a big problem. Yeah. I think as a follow-up, for those of you that are registered, one of the things that we could do is share with you, there's so many resources and community-based organizations that are addressing many of the, the questions that were brought up. So. As a follow-up, we'll send you some of those uh, links and information about m much of the work. I just got two notes. One is in June, we're going to be having a digital inclusion summit here at that we're going to be hosting, the Dallas huh. Fed is hosting in June. Wow. So for those of you that are interested in the issues of digital inclusion, we're going to invite you to come to that where we've got some case studies of things that are working and then also how to, how to actually do something in, in Texas. And then uh, to address the issue of how do you find out about information, there's a website called RevitalizeSouthDallas.com. I subscribe to it. I get it every week. It tells me everything that's happening in and around Dallas, South Dallas Fair Park. It tells me about the events that are going on, what's coming up, what's happening at the community, you know, at the centers, all kinds of great, um, and it's a weekly sort of uh, cadence that just comes all the time. RevitalizeSouthDallas.com. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank all, look, everybody is still here, look, look at you, <laughs> because you care, and I, I can't express that enough in a community, as we look around these really very hard issues, it's all about leadership and showing up and caring and doing the part, you know, doing every, everybody doing what they can. The fact that you're here today is a, a testimony to the work that you're doing, but also the fact that you are vested and that you care about what happens. And so I thank you for being here. I thank you to our leaders for listening and being a part of this forum. We are taking notes and taking the themes so that we can carry those back and talk about them as we go forward. For those of you, everybody that worked on this uh, event today, I thank you very much um, for all of your hard work and I would like to give them a hand for all the logistics that need to be done. And I know I've said this, but I just can't help it, but it's an easy website, dallasfed.org. I really invite you, there's just really some really good information there, um, and, um, and you'll be surprised at some of the things that you might discover, so I encourage you to, to um, join, to come to our website. To all of our friends that are here from, we've got some um, folks here from Washington, thank you for coming here today, that have joined us from the, from the board. Um, and we're, with all that, we're going to adjourn and we hope to see you in the future. Thank you.